have your Bibles this morning, let's turn over to the 52nd division of the book of Psalms. And uh, we're going to talk to you on the confidence of the righteous in troubled times. I believe we qualify. Uh, are you with me? I believe we're in troubled times. And uh, we've got to know where our confidence has got to be. And I believe David talks to us here. I'm going to read the entire psalm this morning, but uh, we're going to deal with from verses 6 through 9 primarily. But really, we're going to deal with all of it, so I'm going to read it all. It's just a short psalm this morning. Amen. Psalms chapter 52. Uh, Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. I love that. Thy tongue deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor working deceitfully. You love evil more than good and lying rather than to speak righteousness. Selah. The little word selah means think about that. Anytime you see that word in the scripture, you want to stop and go back and think about what it is you just read. You love all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. Selah. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. So think about what he's saying here. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it, and I will wait on thy name for it is good before thy saints. Somebody say out a good amen to that. I want to talk this morning, if you will, out of this uh, book of Psalms, and uh, I want to uh, talk to you on the confidence of the righteous in troubled times. I, I know that we talked about this morning in Sunday school that our righteousness within ourselves is as filthy rags. We know that when we talk about our righteousness, we're talking about the righteousness of Christ in us. Would you all agree with that? Whatever we are, it's because of what he's done in us. Whatever good there is in us, it's because of what he's put in us. Amen? We don't just wake up one day and decide, well, I'm just going to be a righteous man today. It's not what it's about. Uh, we wake up and we decide, you know, that uh, we're a sinner. We need to be saved. and We don't know what to do about it. We don't know which way to go. And it's the mercy of God that brings us to Christ. Would you shout a good amen to that? And so David, he wrote this psalm, if you will, give you a little historical background, when he received knowledge that Doeg, the Edomite, the descendant of Esau, uh, when he he'd received knowledge of what they, he had done. Uh, this is the only psalm in the, in the Bible which covers the massacre at Nob. Now you find the story in 1 Samuel chapter number 22. If you remember, David was a man on the run from Saul. Saul was hunting him down and, and was uh, looking for him high and low. And David was constantly on the run. And he went uh, to where some priests were for sanctuary. They gave him sanctuary and also gave him a weapon, not knowing the situation, not knowing what was going on or what David was doing or anything. David never went into disclosure about him running from Saul. When Saul found out about it, uh, he sent Doeg down there, and he massacred the priests along with many that were in the city. It, um, it was a slaughter, if you will. It was not, it was not something to, uh, uh, that uh, the Scripture gives a whole lot of, of uh, understanding to it. But I, again, you read it, 1 Samuel 22. And what bothered David here was not only the act of evil, but also the arrogance of the evil. And... Uh, the boldness and the heartlessness of what he, of everything that had been done, was was what really got to got to David. You know, uh, for uh, many generations, the Bible speaks to us about the heart of man being desperately wicked, and who can know it? It talks to us about the evil that resides within us. We've had others talk to us about man's inhumanity to man. So this is not something that. 
uh, just cropped up in David's time. It's just been there ever since Cain rose up and slew his brother e Abel. Amen. We, we understand that. But we see something different in this. And uh, to me, it just mirrors our generation today. And that is the arrogance of the evil. Not only do they do the evil, not only do they, uh, do they uh, 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 slaughter the innocent, if you will, but they are arrogant about it. They're prideful about it. And this is what concerned David. This is what should concern you and I. Uh, because I, I've said this to you before, we, when we lived in Louisiana, we had some people that had taken and and uh, it was a family that, because this man had lost his brother uh, through a horse accident, his, um, his hatred for horses was just unbelievable. And his, his children grew up with that. And he, um, uh, he had a business where he would take and buy people's horses, and he would take them and sell them to the soap factories. And, and the inhumane treatment that he gave them in between there uh, was uh, well known in the parish. And so... Uh, uh, his son and uh, another guy had uh, had killed uh, uh, some dogs, and the way they killed them, it was just it, it just really uh, rocked the entire parish, and and people everywhere was talking about it for a long time. They wound up going to court, and uh, just got a little slap on the wrist. But I told my wife when this all happened, I said, somebody that could do something like that would have no problem killing a human being. I promise you that. They, they would not have any problem with killing a human being. I, I know that you say, well, Pastor, you're talking about horses and dogs versus a human being. But I'm just talking about the heart of an individual that could take just an innocent creature, if you will, and slaughter them in such a, an ugly massacre type way would have no problem. I wouldn't have any problem saying to you that there's a danger that they could graduate from that uh, to, to slaughtering children or taking uh, somebody's life uh, away from them. That, that, and that's, that, that's the alarming thing here uh, today. Now, I want to just tell you this morning that the vicious attacks of the wicked uh, can never cancel out the loving kindness of our God. Amen. Now, we've got to know that. We've got to have that not just in our head, but we've got to have that in our spirit. Amen. I said to you all ago, this is a, a time that seemed like mirrors our, our generation today. Not only is there wickedness, not only is there evil, there's a bragging about it. There is a, uh, there's a boldness about it. There is a... Uh, arrogance about it. Amen. I seen on uh, news the other day, there was, uh, there was uh, somebody there, and I've said this to you before, this woman had a t-shirt on and she talked about, on there she said, I have had 26 abortions, 26 abortions. And you think about that, 26 human beings that she has had entrusted to her as a mother and she's bragging about having taken their lives. Amen. The arrogance of that. Are you, are you understanding what I'm saying? They, uh, they, uh, they, there was uh, a sign that I read the other day. This guy said, if Jesus should come back, we will just kill him again. And I thought, hey amen, the arrogance of that, the, not, not just the evil mind that could come up with something, just such a thing, but, uh, but the arrogance of that. You know, Romans tells us, he said, because they didn't want to retain God or the knowledge of God in their mind, God had turned them over to a reprobate mind. And that, that's, that's what we're seeing, a reprobate mind. Are you understand what I'm saying? And so there's no, there's no redemption for that. There's no uh, turning away from that. Some of us, we look at them and we say, God, how can this be? How can somebody have uh, such evil in their heart? How can somebody uh, act the way that they're acting? How can somebody be so arrogant about it? Well, the reason is because they have no knowledge of anything good or anything pure or anything holy or anything righteous. It's gone, ladies and gentlemen. There is no consciousness that's been seared with a hot iron. This is a generation on whom the ends of the world has come. Are y'all with me this morning? This is where we are. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about it. And I don't want to take up any time with it this morning, but there's a, uh, there is a, uh, uh, there's a, there's a wickedness about children that are missing and that are exploited and uh, anybody here, let me see your hand. Have you ever heard of a, a, a thing called adrenochrome? You ever heard of that? 
There's one or two hands going up. And what, what this basically amounts to is there are uh, those that have investigated and they believe that there's a lot of politicians involved in this, movie stars involved in this. And what they do is they take children and they terrorize children and the adrenaline that kicks up in their blood when they get them at that place, they either take their lives or they can let their blood and they can drink that blood and it's supposed to keep them youthful and it's supposed to keep them vibrant and so on and so forth. Well, I'm speaking about the arrogance of the evil, so it's that's bad enough. I mean, that's bad enough, but I don't know if you've seen it or not. There was somebody had posted a thing on Facebook yesterday and it was talking about uh, the Bart Simpson series and Bart's dad is talking about adrenochrome on this new series and he's talking about all he needed was the blood of a little boy. And that's what he's alluding to. So see, it's not just the doing of the sin. It's not just the parading of the sin. It's the arrogance of the evil. It's the arrogance of the wicked. And this is what concerned David. This is what ought to concern all of us. It's not, it's not just who's doing it. It's not just the fact that it's going on. It's not just the fact that there's been over 60 million babies aborted. And now our new president has reversed Donald Trump's uh, uh, order where that we don't pay for abortions not only here in our country but overseas and other countries we're now paying for abortions over there amen again or you understand what I'm saying it's the arrogance of it it's it's the pride of it it's the wicked evil heart that is on display thumbing our nose at God almighty I don't know if you saw the uh, the health secretary of of the new president uh, there, there was a picture of him he was dressed up as a baby doll a grown man dressed up as a baby doll. Ladies and gentlemen, this arrogance of the wickedness of their heart parading in the streets. I remember many years ago, B.H. Clinton had made this statement. He said, that is the last give up of God. He said, when the homosexual crowd comes out of the closet and begins to demand their rights and parade their sin up and down the streets of our cities, he said, that is one of the last give ups of Almighty God. You say, Pastor what are you saying? I'm saying to you this morning that it's time we lift up our head. It's time that we lift up our eyes under the hills from where our help comes from because the sounding of the trump of God is upon us in this generation that we're living in now. It's more important that we be salt and light now than has ever been in the history of our world. It's more important that we live for God as we sang about a while ago that he's all we want Amen. We need to recognize he's all we need and he ought to be all we want. It's time that we realize that. Amen. Now I want us to notice some stuff here in verses 1 through 4 exposes the wicked, the vicious attacks of the wicked for what they are. Verse 1 talks about the wicked boasting empty victories. You see, Doag, this Edomite, he, he, he went and he slaughtered a band of of defenseless priests. That's who he killed. Uh, now, 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 listen to me. <laughs> uh, these these priests had never had a sword in their hand in their lifetime. Think about what I'm saying. They were not men of war. They were men of peace. They were men with a commission to help all who came and knocked on their door. David was that certain man. But there was such a hatred for David in Saul's heart that he sent, when he found out what the priest had done, he sent this dog-like man, this Edomite, and told him to take care of the situation. And he slaughters them. And many that were in the city, he took this well. It took a real man to kill people who had never picked up a sword in their life. The arrogance of their evil, it took somebody that's really big and bad to the bone to take the life of such an innocent group of people. There was a time, ladies and gentlemen, that a real warrior would have been ashamed of such an act. You understand what I'm saying? 
There was a time when he would have never done it because David alluded to Saul. He, he meant by these words to say, how can you by nature be called to a more noble purpose and yet sink to such a level as this for a king to boast in the slaughter of such a wicked and heartless situation is beyond my ability to, to brag. I seen the other day where the archdiocese in San Francisco was rebuking, openly rebuking Nancy Pelosi for her stand on abortion. And Nancy Pelosi had made this statement, and somebody said this morning in Sunday school, said the open persecution of the body of Christ is upon us in this country, and you can believe that. Now, you can believe that, ladies and gentlemen. You can sit here with your head in the sand and not believe it, but the fact of the matter is there are politicians today that are saying that the 74-plus million people that voted for Donald Trump, and that includes most evangelical Christians, ladies and gentlemen, need to be put in a concentration camp and need to be deprogrammed because we're not right in the head. Some of us are not right in the head. You understand what I'm saying to you? I'm not saying that we're all perfect. And it's not just evangelical Christians that voted for President Trump. What the point I'm trying to make is, is that when you disagree with somebody, it's not just they want to accept. They want you to embrace their wickedness and their sin. And if you're not willing to do that, then you are something wrong in your head. And you don't need to be a part of society anymore. This is, this is where we are. This is where we've come to in our nation. There's already talk, ladies and gentlemen, about persecution. Uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi made this statement. She said, my worst enemies are evangelical Christians. Years ago, they were talking about how that we were the ones that were causing all the trouble in society. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be light, and we're supposed to be salt. Darkness don't like the light. Would you say amen to that? Jesus said he came into his own and they received him not because they preferred darkness rather than light. It's not just a matter. They want you to ignore what they're doing. How many of you have ever heard somebody make the statement, this is America, you can do what you want to do. Just don't expect me to embrace what you do. Well, that's not good enough anymore. They don't want equality. They want you to embrace. They want to indoctrinate our children in our school system to understand that they have to embrace every alternative lifestyle that there is. I've seen that big old goofy looking thing in that baby doll outfit and I thought to myself, if that wasn't so serious, that would be funny. I'd be so humiliated Y'all hear what I'm saying? To even, to even dress like that in public as a man. I heard an old preacher years ago, he made this statement, said, where are all the men at anymore? He sees that picture, he's going to flip out, ain't he? Well, notice the goodness of God endures forever is what the Bible says. And it's a beautiful contrast between what had happened with the priest and what is going on in the heart and mind of God. The devil's fury cannot dry up the rivers of the mercies of God. If the priests are slain, God's still alive. Would you say amen to that? If they come in here and shoot us, God is still alive. If they come in here and lock us up, God is still on the throne. Would you say a good amen to that? And that's what galls them, ladies and gentlemen, because they can't stand God. I told my wife whenever they okayed the same-sex marriage, I said, that's Pandora's box right there. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, the next thing you know, just mark it down and see if I'm a prophet or not. I said, the Mormons are going to demand their right to go back to having multiple wives, and that's already taken place. Uh, you've got people that's going to be demanding that uh, 
Uh, they can have sex with animals, and that's already gone to the court system. And that they can marry animals, that they, and also that pedophiles. I seen somebody the other day uh, in the government say that pedophiles don't need to be locked up in prison. That is their sexual orientation, the same way homosexuality is the orientation of, of these that are homosexual. So you don't need to punish them because that is what their sexual preference is. And we've got to learn to embrace them, and we've got to learn. Learn to let them be them. And, and you know what they're saying? Said, let them prey upon your children because they can't really help what's going on with that. Are you understand what I'm saying? I seen something on Facebook yesterday where this guy went into the uh, bathroom at, uh, I think it was a Target store with this, uh, this other man's uh, uh, daughter. And he said he identified as a woman. And whenever his, his daddy saw him, her daddy saw him in there, he knocked his teeth out and he told him, he said, I'm identifying as a tooth fairy. Would you say amen to that? I thought, my God, <laughs> this is where we are. Are you understand how silly it is? I seen somebody on news the other night saying we don't have babies anymore. We have babies, and what that is is you don't give them a sex until they get at least four years old, and let the child tell you if they're male or if they're female or not. Ladies and gentlemen, this is stuff that you can't make up. This is where we are. That reprobate mind has no ending to it. It has no bottom to the debauchery. It has no end to the evil and to the wickedness in the heart of a human being that doesn't acknowledge God in our situation. Verses 4 and 2 through 4 talks about the wicked pursue deceit and destruction with the tongue. Grandpa said they'd rather t climb a tree to tell a lie, or yeah, try, climb a tree to tell a lie, and, and rather than stand on the ground, tell the truth. He said they speak with ulterior motives. They have good for evil and good and evil for good. And if good and evil were present, they would choose evil over the good. They do it every day. David said they had a taste. They had a gusto, if you will, for evil language. Somebody said, boy, this is not much of a shouting message. Well, it ought to be because we've got to have confidence in these times. When you see this stuff on television and hear it on the radio and you see it parading up and down our streets and you hear it from our school system, somebody's going to have to be able to say, as a believer, that we have confidence it goes beyond the situation that we're looking at and his name is Jesus. Would you shout a good amen to that? I know they don't like that name, but I'm going to shout it from the housetop. Only through the blood of the Christ can we get to the Father. And ladies and gentlemen, he is our our only hope in this time that we're living in today. Amen. Now, I'm just going to tell you, saints of God, I never thought that I'd ever see things come to where they are today. I, I, never, I never dreamed that we would see the things that we have seen get by the court systems. And it don't make no difference who appoints the Supreme Court. Have you noticed that? It don't make no difference if they're supposed to be righteous. It don't make no difference if they're supposed to be disciplined to the, uh, to the, uh, to the Constitution of the United States. All of them seem to be more worried about appeasing those that are constantly squawking. Grandpa said the squeaking wheel always gets the grease. And so they don't want to do anything to rock the boat. They don't want to make anybody mad. And in so doing, they shout out all righteousness and all godliness and all holiness and all scripture and all truth in Christ our Savior. Just so that so-and-so won't be offended. Well, I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I don't mind telling you, I'm offended. I was offended when I seen that idiot on that, in that baby doll you know, outfit. You understand what I'm saying? I'm, I'm looking down and I said, this is who our president has put in as the leader of the health of our nation. <laughs> you know, if I'd have wanted that job, they looked at me and said, you're too fat. You don't qualify. You're going to be a poor example for health. And he's right. They'd be right to say that to me. But 
what kind of a mind have they put in one of the most important positions for the sake of our young people in this nation? Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, it's not without agenda. Now let me hurry on. Verses 5 through 7, we see the executing of the wicked to the delight of the believers. And I'm going to just tell you this. We should take no delight in anything that happens, but that's not what he's talking about here. Verse 5 speaks about it. He talks about how certain it is and how final it is. I'm just going to tell you right here that I've read the back of the book like Grandpa told me to, and you know what? We win. Would you say amen to that? The church wins. Upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Would you shout a good amen to that? I'm here is to tell you ladies and gentlemen it's time the body of Christ stop arguing with one another and start debating with one another and begin to believe that together we can stand and unify around the cross of Christ and understand that but for the cross we're still lost ladies and gentlemen he said they speak with these ulterior motives and he said just as sure as they do I'm going to take you away God's going to sweep them away like the ashes from an old burnout firehouse or fireplace. He said, I'm going to quench the truth. He said, he would have quenched the truth. And God said, I'm going to quench him. And I'm going to pluck him up out of his dwelling place and root him out of the land of the living. The prosecutor or the persecutor shall be eradicated, pulled up by the root. Somebody say, man, he, shall, he, he sought the death of others and death is going to seek him out. I like that. Ladies and gentlemen, I understand hand that we're living in a time today if David was living in our time David would say God would you wipe out our enemies would you destroy our enemies and that's the reason David's writing like this but I know that when Jesus came he brought about a different way and when Jesus came this is what he said pray for those who despitefully use you give to those that ask of you you understand what he's saying? Grace, ladies and gentlemen, is a whole different dispensation, and we're not to relish. We're warned not to relish that judgment belongs to God. But I want to point out a couple of things to you this morning in verses five, uh, 6 and 7. He talked about the delight of the righteous, and, and, and he said that um, he said there, it increased the righteousness fear of God. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen. In my mind, in my opinion today, that one of the great deficits in the church is we don't fear God. There's no fear of God. We've got this slapping God on the back business going on in the church world today. Just treat him like he's one of us, you know. Pull him down and just make him like one of us. But he's almighty God, ladies and gentlemen. He's creator of the heavens and the earth. He called himself our friends. But he never wants you to get the idea that he's like some kind of a beer drinking buddy with you. He's God. He holds our next breath in the palm of his hand. He doesn't have any problem snuffing out the wicked, ladies and gentlemen. He's almighty God. He holds them in the palm of his hand. And while I was disgusted at the parade of this person dressed up like that baby doll, I believe the heart of God was broken when he looked over the balcony of heaven and saw such going on in the, in the United States of America. There's only been two nations in the history of our world that God ever had anything to do with founding. And one of them was the nation of Israel, and the other one was the United States of America. And they don't want our children to understand this, but our nation was built on the Judeo-Christian ethic. Now I want you to remember a couple of things this morning about the righteous being, being uh, persecuted by, by the wicked. Remember when God allowed Mordecai to see Haman hanging on his own gallows? Y'all remember that? 
You remember how Haman went out against the Jews. He was going to eradicate the Jews, and he hated Mordecai so bad, and he said, I'm going, to, I'm going to do away with all the Jews, and he started out against them, and whenever it all said and done, the gallows that he'd built for Mordecai, he got hung on his own self, and Mordecai got to see that. Do you remember David whenever Saul sought him and run after him and chased after him? Do you remember when Joab brought the tokens of the fact that Saul had been killed on, mountain, on the mountains of Gilboa? He brought tokens to such a fact and laid them at David's feet. And David was able to see and understand that the enemy that had chased him and run him like a ragged dog all of that time was now dead and he was free from him. You see, saints of God, this is the thing that we need to understand. We, they, re, they refuse to trust God, so their epitaph goes something like this. This is the man who made not God his strength. This is the man that trusted in his own fortune. He found a fortress, but it was not the Lord. He gloried in might, but it was not in the Almighty. He gloried in his own might. He who had lorded it over the people of God with pride and arrogance, he who had kept his heel on the neck of the righteous have now been eradicated. Now, let me just tell you something. Part of the thing that people don't want to except in our generation today, is a judgment of God. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you, saints. I honestly believe this. The judgment of God is not just when we get there and we stand as Christians before the judgment seat of Christ, and then after the millennial reign, they stand as the resurrected dead who refuse Christ at the judgment, uh, at the great white throne judgment. I believe that God judges us now. I believe that a lot of times we reap what we sow now. You understand what I'm saying? I believe that. I've seen people that give their heart to God still reap a harvest from their sinful days whenever they come by. Merle Haggard used to sing that old song. Y'all remember the song where he said, Mama prayed my crops would fail. Do you know what he was saying in that? All the seed that I had sown out there in the world, all the wickedness and all the sin that I had done, he said, my mama was praying that my crops would fail that I wouldn't reap a full harvest of what I had done. Now, I'm just going to tell you, saints of God, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that all the harvest that I had coming in didn't come in. I'm glad that because of God's grace and His mercy, And my confidence in what he's done eradicated some of the harvest that I rightfully should have been reaping. And when I think about that, and I look at my enemies and I see my enemies fall to the left and see them fall to the right, then while there may be a laughter. He said a laughter there. I don't think he's talking about jubilance. I don't think that he's talking. I think he's talking more about a somberness. Because we realize that but for his grace, that would be us. Do you really think that any one of us here outside of Christ, had we gone to the place that we didn't want to retain God in our knowledge and God had turned us over to a reprobate mind, do you think any of us are above putting on an outfit like that and parading around in the face of the Almighty like, what are you going to do about it? The answer to that is no, we're not. Now, we were talking this morning in Sunday school about miracles. Somebody rightly said that the greatest miracle that we could ever see, that ever witness in our lifetime, is when a man or a woman or a young person finds an altar of prayer and gets up out of there, a born-again, spirit-filled child of God. 
There is no greater miracle than that in all of the world. Because he that was dead in his trespasses and sin, he that was on the road to the same place Doeg was, has now been snatched out of hell's flames and put on the right path. Would you say amen? Amen. That's the reason Paul said, let this mind which was in Christ Jesus also be in you. He said, because your mind is not right. And we recognize that as we come into the saving knowledge of Christ and we get our heads in the Word of God, we realize that our confidence in this time is that we're pursuing a greater knowledge of the Son of God. (laughs) I don't just want to know about Him. I want to know Him. Would you say amen to that? Paul said, I count everything that's been about in my life as dung that I may know him. Hallelujah. Forgetting all these things, this one thing I do, he said, I press toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering." I got to wrap this up because Brother Bumgardner's hungry. I love you, Brother Bumgardner. Verses 8 and 9 talks about the confidence of the righteous. Our confidence is in the loving kindness of God. No matter what we face, no matter what we're going through, No matter what you're going through right now this morning, no matter what we as a church, as the body of Christ, are headed for in our future. Now, we've already known, we've already talked about it and shouted about how that God is opening up the windows of heaven. Brother Doug said this morning, he said, I don't believe it was just for Lake Hamilton. He said, I believe it is for the church worldwide, and I believe that. But I want to bring your attention to something else. You show me historically in the Word of God, or go back in history and show me any great move of the Holy Ghost, and I'll show you where the enemy was coming, and he was trying to squinch it and squelch it and shut it down. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And the Raider. They said, Hitler said, I'll take them and I'll never fire a shot. Hitler is worm bait, ladies and gentlemen, and the church is still going on. Would you say a good amen to that? Several years ago, our brothers and sisters in the Orient made the statement. They said, we in America, in the church in America, needs a good old-fashioned persecution. I got offended when I heard that. But when I thought about what they said, they are meeting in underground churches and places where the state-run church who's only preaching what the government tells them to preach. We're coming there, church. We're coming there. If this message is going out over Facebook this morning, if if they happen to stumble across it, they'll shut us down because of what I've said, some of the things that I've said this morning. Doesn't make any difference that it's truth. Doesn't make any difference that the Word of God backs me up. They don't want to hear it. They're not going to receive it, and they'll shut you down. It's not they want to have a debate about it. They don't even want to have a debate. They want you to concur with them, and if you don't concur with them, then everything is going to be off the board. There is no dis- no debate, no discussion about it. You have no standing unless you stand with them. Then I say we don't have a standing. And I'm talking about in this world. Our standing is with him whom they crucified. Come on, church. He and he alone is the access to the Father. He and he alone can reconcile us back to our creator. Would you shout a good amen to that? Not our goodness, not our righteousness, not our church, not our services, but him in the person of Christ, my faith and my confidence in him. The fact that he knows the way that I take is my confidence in this hour right now. He explains the confidence of the righteous in the loving kindness of God. Imagine the fruitfulness of, and blessing. He said, I'm like a green olive tree in the house of God. Somebody say amen. 
David said, I may be hunted and I may be persecuted, but I'm like a green olive tree. I'm not plucked up. I'm not destroyed. I'm flourishing like an olive tree draws oil out of the rock. Somebody say amen. Even in the midst of drought, he said, I'm still living. I'm still growing. I'm still flourishing. My God, I want to shout right there. You hear what I'm saying? It don't make no difference what's going on. Get your eyes off of what's going on and get your head in the Word of God and understand that God is still on your side and we need to get on God's side. And when we do, we can understand that God stands up beside us. Now notice where he said he does it at. I do all this growing and flourishing in the house of God. Now I'm going to say this, and I'm going to have, I'm going to, have to wrap this up. One of the great things that has happened in our nation, and in fact around the world, during the year 2020, and it's starting in 2021 because now they're hollering, you don't need to just wear one mask, you need to wear two masks. That's what they're saying. And even after the vaccine, you go and get the vaccine, you still, there's no guarantee that you won't get COVID, so you still got to social distance, you still got to stay at home, you got to wear a mask. I told you this when it started like last year, it's about control, control, control. They've got to get us to where when they say jump, we holler how high. They got to get us where they, if they say left, we go left automatic. If they say right, we go right automatic. How in the world did Hitler lead all those Jews to the death camps? Amen. The first thing he done is he disarmed them. Somebody say amen right there. And then he began to tear down the family unit. He began to stop them from congregating. He began to, are you hearing what I'm saying? I said to you the other night, I heard this guy was prophesying. He said, because God or because the devil has put a muzzle on the mouth of the church, that God is fixing to set the mouth of the church free. But I'm going to tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, what I saw in 2020 was not the muzzling of the church, but a rerouting of the structure of the body of Christ. Amen. We were not able to congregate. We got people that are not here this morning on the count of COVID because their system is so weak. They dare not even get the flu, let alone COVID. And I understand that. I have no stones to throw at that. But through social media, the gospel has gone out in channels that they never thought of. I, I seen the other day, Brother Son has got us on some other program now, not just Facebook and not just uh, 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 Rumble, but he's got us on something else. And every avenue, ladies and gentlemen, opened up a new audience for folks to hear the gospel of Christ. Amen. And that's not just Lake Hamilton. So what the devil meant for bad, God turned around and used for good. Would you say amen to that? Like the mercy of God, David said, his thankfulness is going to be the same. I will praise you forever. Now, our brother stood this morning, gave testimony of what happened to him yesterday. But his praise is in, not in what happened to him. His praise is in what didn't happen to him. God watched over him. Say amen right there. God protected him. Now, having said all that, my dear brother, if you open that door again, some of these women are going to come down to the house and they're going to hurt you. I'll just tell you, them women are bad when they get turned on. What's your confidence in, church? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for the Word of God. We want to thank you for the people of God, for the house of God, for the fact, God, that we can congregate together and come together and worship you in spirit and in truth. God, we just bless your name. We thank you, Lord, because we don't know what's coming tomorrow, but we know who holds tomorrow. I don't know what these folk are faced with right now in their life, but I know that, God, their confidence must be in you. God, the only way we can do that is we've got to quit looking at the circumstances in the world around us and turn off the television news who doesn't do anything but show us the bad and lies to us about everything that's good. So we need to shut that mess off, and we need to concentrate on the Word of God because that's where the good news is found, that your grace is always sufficient and your power is always present, and the anointing of the Holy Ghost is always there to lead God and direct your body. 
So, Lord, today forgive us for putting our confidence somewhere other than you. Forgive us, Lord, for looking to the left and to the right and not taking and focusing our attention upon you and what you've done for us and on what the Word of God says. David saw such wickedness, brazen, arrogant wickedness in his day, and David's answer was, I'm going to continually praise you. I'm going to continually look to you. I'm going to continually watch you because when I do that, he said, I'll see my enemies fall at the left hand and at the right hand. And I know that God, some of us here have seen that happen in our life. And while we didn't take to the streets and Facebook and boast about our enemies falling, we also knew that it was God's work and it was God's hand. And but for your grace and mercy, it could have been us. Now, Father, have your way this day in our lives and forgive us where we fall short. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said a good amen and amen.